Uh, and I just threw in a couple of pictures of how independent children really are in the Netherlands too. I mean, once they're in that kind of, well, this this picture actually is is people taking, young children taking their uh, test. Yes. Of yeah, usually about certified. 11 or 12 years old. 11 of age, years old, through. 11 or 12 years old. So this, this uh, children that you saw in the previous slide were about that age. And they have complete independence. I mean, that's something that actually makes a child happy. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman, and that is Kathy Tuttle, now living in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, Kathy has been on the podcast once before. Uh, you can check that episode out. I think it was episode number 140, way back in 2022. Uh, the link will be in the show notes. Uh, but hey, let's get right to it with Kathy Tuttle. Kathy Tuttle, welcome back to the Active Tens podcast. So great to see you again, John. And now it I'm really, coming from a different continent. You are, yes, yeah. When we uh, we spoke the last time, uh, which was way back in episode 140, uh, you were living in the uh, Portland area. I'm going to pull this back a little bit there, and it even says right there, Portland, Oregon based. And uh, yeah, so we, we talked about uh, the, the whole concept of needing to have a car plan. <laughs> and so that was a lot of fun. I encourage everybody, uh, if you haven't listened to or watched that particular episode, episode number 140, go back, check it out. That was from way back in uh, 2022. Uh, but yeah, you're on a different continent now. Where the heck are you? So I'm in the city of Utrecht, which is uh, just a 30 minute train ride from from Amsterdam. And it's arguably the best city in the Netherlands, which is the best city in the world for people who bike and take transit. So I'm very privileged and love being here. I've been here for about a year. It's funny that you uh, that you say arguably the best. Um, I get pressured of saying, well, what are your favorite cities and what, 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 what is the best active town? And I try not to, to pick favorites and I try not to, to you know, be able to say, well, the uh, best is this. Because every city, you know, like, uh, like the Utrecht and, and Delft, which is one of my favorites um, and I visit, you know, frequently, they really just have so much and, they're, and there's so much vitality and vibrancy there. Uh, what's really, really interesting about Utrecht, and we can talk a little bit about this, is just how uh, cosmopolitan it is. I mean, it's one of the most vibrant, one of the busiest places, uh, but it doesn't have that same tourist overwhelmed sort of a vibe to it that, say, you know, the central area, the old historic area of Amsterdam might have. So before we get into the details of, of Utrecht, and, and, and I know we're going to spend a little bit of time about sort of the cultural aspects that you're, um, you're, you're thinking about, uh, for those who haven't watched the, the first episode or listened to the first episode, I'm going to give you just 30 seconds to introduce yourself to say who, who the heck Kathy Tuttle actually is. Okay, well, I'm a, I'm a city planner and I'm an anthropologist, and I uh, worked for many years for the city of Seattle. I, I helped to build and plan 40 parks for the city of Seattle, and then I got very involved in active transportation advocacy. I started a group in Seattle called Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and then I moved to Portland. I kind of retired to Portland and got jumped right back into advocacy there, and I'm on the board of a group called Bike Loud. Uh, and I'm still on the boards of two groups in Seattle and in Portland, by Cloud and Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. But now that I'm in Utrecht, I'm part of the Feetzers Bond, the bike advocacy group here. So I stay with my, my fingers in advocacy space. I love it. I love it. Now, and, and I think that some people who might be tuning into this who aren't aware of the dynamics that uh, uh, that are in play there in the Netherlands, they might not realize that there's still that need for advocacy work in the Netherlands. Uh, obviously, the Fietzerbahn was was instrumental in a lot of the work that was done uh, in the 1970s and into the 80s and really pushing forward into the 1990s of the build out of what we now 
know as the Dutch cycling network and the, the, you know, the modern interpretation and the modern version of the cycling culture that is in, in, the, in the Netherlands. Talk a little bit about that, the fact that there is still an advocacy organization. Oh, there's a in, serious in the bit of advocacy. And, and in fact, the visa Bond is great because they're saying what we have is fine, but we still have to include other people in making this a an even better place for uh, new immigrants that are coming to, to the Netherlands, for children who may not be safe now on some of the, the bike lanes because they're so, so crowded. We have to address elders who can't get around easily now because there's so much traffic on the road from both bikes and there still is car traffic too. I mean, that's the other thing is people think, oh, you know, the, the Netherlands, it's just all bikes all the time. But in fact, biking even here in Utrecht is, is maybe only 30 or 40% of all trips. And there's still plenty of other impediments to getting around safely by bike. Yeah. And the, the difference in advocacy here is that when the Features Bond writes letters to the government, the government actually takes them super seriously and gets the work done. Would you say that that relationship is more, is it more adversarial or is it more partnership or is it a balance between the two? For advocacy in the Netherlands? Yeah, mm-hmm. the Fietzer bond, the role that the Fietzer's, the modern role that well, the Well, I think it bond. depends, like, in the U.S. I mean, some some governments are elected that are just terrific to work with, you know, and that, that's been true even in the work that I've done in, in the, the U.S. You know, it depends on who's mayor, you know, it depends on who's been elected to, to be the power um the, the power within the city. And in the case of Utrecht, the person who's in charge of the transportation department is from the Green Party. The person who's in charge of, well, the vice mayor in charge of kind of municipal works is from the Green Party, as is the mayor. So the citizens of Utrecht have elected people that support the values of people who are biking and getting around in a clean, healthy way. And, and I guess, and this is my interpretation and my, um, I guess, assumption, is that the feature bond is is also sort of at the table in terms of being able to, to be a working partner with the municipality. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, for the most part, um, both at the at the national table and then also at the uh, the local tables when new plans are putting put in place for for changing how much the paths are widened or where they're going to go or where the bike parking is going to be. They're, they're asked for advice early in the process. And I think that's super critical in making good infrastructure happen is that they get engaged early and they actually go out and get information from the feeds Bond, which is full of experts who've been working on this for ages. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a good introduction, and, and uh, now it's time to look at some pretty pictures and some videos and, and everything. Uh, you sent through a whole bunch of visuals. One of the things that you sent through is this video of what I would call just a typical scene uh, there in Utrecht. Let's talk well, a little bit about What I told you to, to yeah. yeah, this one is the only one I said to put the audio up on it, because I want you to hear what the street sounds like yeah. Uh, in a typical, you know, this is early rush hour on a, a winter evening, so people are all bundled up. Yeah. But listen to it. Listen to how much noise is being made on this street that has about 40,000 people passing by on it every day. Yeah. It's a street that holds 40,000 people. Think about yeah. streets like that in your cities. And so we, do see, we do see buses, we do see motor vehicles mm-hmm. that are in there. We just saw a person on a mm-hmm. mobility trike uh, ride by. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it truly is an environment that is welcoming, um, you know, to everybody. And I think that's- And this is what the street looked like, this is what the street looked like 50 years ago. So yes, the same street. Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, let's let's make sure I, 
uh, zoom out on this a little bit and, and we can get all the wording in there as well so folks can see that. So yeah, this is one of the busiest streets in all of the Netherlands and in and particularly in Utrecht. And yeah, I mean, let, let that sink in. I mean, 1964, the, the, the year before I was born, uh, this is what the street looked like. And so, you know, it's been tweaked with ever since 1964. I mean, it it didn't automatically turn into the street that you just saw in that video. It started in this condition. And already you can see there was a lot of tweaking going on. There were bike lanes on this street. There's a very wide, nice crosswalk on this street. I mean, there's a lot of things on this very major 40,000 vehicle a day or person a day street that I think a lot of American cities would be delighted to have protected bike lanes, big wide, big wide crosswalk, a little median island, uh, dedicated bike, a dedicated bus lane. But the Dutch are in the process of continual improvement. And this, this uh, particular street is an example of that. I mean, just think about that. Think about what street is in your town that has 40,000 vehicles on it. I mean, I'm thinking about in Seattle, Aurora is about to be redone. I'm thinking about in uh, in Portland, 82nd or Powell Boulevard are about to be redone and they carry 40,000 vehicles. This is 40, 000, what 40,000 vehicles could look like in your city. Right. And I think that's a really, really good point is to differentiate between the concept of moving vehicles versus transporting and giving people the opportunity to move through a space. Uh, I had this conversation a couple years ago with uh, with Leonard Nout right there in the city of Utrecht and we were looking at some of the streets and he was saying, yeah, I mean, we can move as many as 10 times as many people through a street that looks like this, where we have transit prioritized and people uh, oriented infrastructure like bicycle infrastructure emphasized because it's just far more efficient to move people, a large number of people through bikeways and leveraging transit than it is for single occupancy automobiles because those are just incredibly space inefficient. Yep. So, so the thing that I, and I, I actually wanted to bring you into my house. So you see the tulips behind me, but I also wanted to, see, to show you the tulips in front of me. This is my view. I'm looking out the window right now, and this is what I see, these beautiful tulips uh, and this courtyard. So the city has zoned this 100-person apartment building so that there, there's this huge courtyard that I overlook. Uh, in another urban context, this would, might be all infilled as well. You know, this might be just full to the brim with housing, but this can still be a very dense city and yet allow green, allow kind of healthy places to, to be can here. I, can I interject real yeah. quick and say that since you just mentioned that, it might be filled with something else. When I look at this, I'm looking like, yeah, oh, yeah. here in Texas, that it would be car that, parking. <laughs> you, you got it. <laughs> It would be filled with cars because maybe maybe there is that orientation of you know orienting to the street and 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 so there's not a massive parking lot in front of the development. Well, there is a parking lot under that that exactly. beautiful one. I, again, this is an anti anti car. It's not like the the Netherlands is a, a massively anti car uh, country and and but there to use the term from our first episode, there's a car management plan. Mm -hmm. And they're managed to be out of sight in this particular context. And instead I get birds and quiet, quiet on that major street with 40,000 people moving through it and quiet in my backyard, even though it's full of a hundred people who live here. So one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about, I've been thinking a lot about, I've been here for about a year, is the values that public space have that are reflected in the built environment. I think that, you know, we see a lot of great videos coming out from all sorts of creators, not just bikes and Bicycle Dutch and filmed by Feetzer and all these, these, these terrific programs. And they're about the, the infrastructure itself, but as an anthropologist, as well as a planner, 
I think that there are values that are reflected in the space. Uh, and I, I wanted to go through some of them and give some examples. That's some, some of the, the uh, images that I sent you. Yeah. Can, can, I show, show, can I show the next photo? Because I think this is a reflection of some value, too. Ah, it's the, well, this is my parking. <laughs> yeah. That is a reflection of, of some of the values, just like you're saying. Yep. Yep. So this is this is my bike. I wanted to introduce you to it because it's how I get around. I don't have a car here. Actually, I don't have a car anywhere, but I spend most of my my days getting from place to place by bike, even though I live, you know, in walkable, uh, maybe a 10 minute walk from that that street that I showed you in the first slide in that, that video. But bikes are just so easy to use. So 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 let me just kind of run through the, the five values that I wanted to talk about. So, so the Dutch have struck me as being some of the most practical common sense people on earth. Uh, they like to be logical. They like to be punctual. I don't know if you've ever been late to a Dutch meeting, but it is a big no-no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they For, like, fortunately, it was another Dutch person who was causing us to be late. So that were, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> but they are the most kind of rational, common sense, logical people uh, on, on this earth. So that's reflected in the space. Uh, so that's one. Uh, another is they're very interested in consensus building, in listening and adapting. I mean, you can see that in the streets, how much it's been a, 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 a way of a little push, a little pull. It, it's a very important value in the society as being consensus there, There's a term building. for that too, right? I haven't is, learned it yet. In I Dutch, I, I mean. Yeah, I think it's a pol polder some, something. Oh, yeah. I mean, polders are the are the uh, canals that need to be drained in certain ways to yeah. make sure that and, and, and I'm sure we'll get some. Flood. And I'm sure we'll get some comments uh, to to this video down below of the the context of that. But it seems that you're you're sparking something in my memory that part of that consensus building is attached I mean, the, to the, the word might yeah. be like polder like, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, being a, a polder ish person, uh, but, uh, but listening and adapting. And along with that is another value, which is a, a, a very high degree of tolerance, especially at, at the tolerance of other cultures. I think because the Dutch have always been going out from the Netherlands to other places and then embracing what they learned and bringing it back. They, they tend to be a very tolerant people. Yeah. So fourth, the fourth concept yeah. is uh, the Dutch really are interested in self-reliance. You know, they want to be independent and self-reliant, but it's also coupled with this idea of being a place that does a lot of sharing and it, at first glance, that doesn't seem to sort of fit together. They share, and yet they want to be self-reliant. But I, I think a big part is that they want to make sure that everybody has the ability to be self-reliant. So they share tools, they share bicycles, they share ideas, they share just ways of, of getting around, they share housing. But at the same time, they want people to be able to do for themselves. So it's a you know, maybe it comes from their agrarian past or their polder culture, but they're a, a self-reliant but sharing people. And then finally, very important value in the Netherlands is saving money. Right. They they value frugality over bling. You know, they want things to be a good cost, you know, this is a big value in the Netherlands. This thing costs very little. So common sense, consensus building, tolerance, sharing, and saving money. And you see all of those reflected in the streets. And I, that's what I wanted to look at is like seeing how some of those values actually actually came out in the streets. So the, the next thing that I wanted you to pull up was a little video of me biking along the road to where I go. So this is the side of my building. Behind those walls is where the that beautiful backyard is that's shared by a hundred households. And then I just go along this beautifully paved road. And you can see there's lots of cars, right. but there's also tons of bikes. And this is rush hour. I'm on my way to my my uh, Dutch class, but look how many cars are parked there. And then there's this big surprise. There's a windmill. 
out there. That's a historic landmark. It doesn't function as a windmill, but there are a number of windmills in my, my neighborhood. You can see that, you know, you expect every Dutch road is going to have this, this, you know, glorious protected bike lane, but it doesn't. It's a road that's shared by cars. Again, bringing up that quality of sharing with the, you know, everybody has, has given a, a little bit in order to get a lot. And you can see trucks. You know, the, the Dutch road system is not universally just for people on bikes. Right. Yeah. And there's, there is that tension there, too, that we, we, we know that they're, they're dealing with many of the same challenges that many other cultures and many other cities are dealing with. Uh, the, we'll, we'll press play on this video too, because this is the, you know, uh, the fact that there, this isn't a, te a testament to the fact that, yeah, they have, they have freeways too. They have expressways. And yet look how well they're shared, you know, look how well, well, also look at the size of the vehicles on the, on the freeways. <laughs> yes. Uh, <they're> <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> for the most part, they're not as big. Correct. Yes. W what's interesting though, too, is that, you know, when I do see, the expressways, the, the national highways like this, one of the things that, that I'm always impressed with is I'm usually getting a bird's eye view like this uh, from one of the overpasses of one of the, the cycling facilities, one of the feet pads that, that happens to be going over them. In fact, one of my favorite ones is just outside of Utrecht, uh, on, making my way to Houghton. You know, you go over the, you, you go over and you can stop and you can you know shoot a little video just like that, and it's it's very interesting. And so there, but there is that balance, there is that tension that's in place that you know between the fact that we are sharing, they are sharing space with these motor vehicles, and it it's not utopia. They're they're still they are very very concerned with the fatality rates that they are seeing. Um, out on their roadways, and specifically a couple years ago, uh, I think it was now, they had a report on the serious injuries and fatality rates on their streets that were uh, the 50 kilometer per hour uh, streets, and you know, really striving to say, hey, in the spirit of what you talked about earlier, is that there is that spirit of continuous improvement. They want to continually improve their streets. They're like, yeah, this is unacceptable. We need to be addressing the fact that the serious injuries and fatality rates through collisions is too high. We need to be working on that. And some of the biggest concerns is that there still are those situations where there's conflicts between people walking and biking uh, and people driving. Right. But, but you know, the, the, the clip that you showed of people driving, you know, people are driving in a in a sensible way, in a logical, practical, punctual way. Uh, you know, one of the reasons they don't, you know, are trying not to have, have collisions is that people, if they collide, cause long traffic backups. And that makes people late and they don't like that. And, and can I say, can I, can I say one thing real quick, uh, Kathy, since I pulled the video back up again, is that also what happened a, a few years ago was Waze did a, a, a survey of uh, internationally where the most satisfied and uh, you know, drivers were. And the Netherlands came up out on top is that it's like, yeah, it's like it is one of the most satisfying places uh, for drivers to drive. And I think that is reflect what's partly reflected in that is that there is mobility choice, and so the driving experience is a much more uh, pleasurable experience compared to other places where to drive is really not much fun at all. Well, people love their cars in the Netherlands, and in fact, because it's a wealthy country, per capita, uh, per household, more people own cars in the Netherlands than own cars in the U.S. I mean, it's a, it's a very wealthy country. But the the thing is, people don't use them the same way that they use them in the U.S. They, and they don't use them as often. Yeah. Um, and that's what I wanted this graph to is. Out. Yeah. That's what yeah. this graphic graphic is about. Is is I did a, a windshield survey of 800 car drivers. This was last year. 800 car drivers uh, in the Netherlands, and the question was, why do you own a car, and what do you do with your car? And these were the answers people gave. Uh, and the main thing that they did with their car was go on vacation, visit relatives, visit friends, 
So, you know, and then you're getting into the 50% heavy sh shopping, but nobody is using them to get to work, to take their kids to school. Uh, you know, some are, but compared yeah, I was to the say, US. It, it, yeah, it, it's not that not, not you know, it, there's, I think it's at like 22% work is far away. So Exactly. Yeah. But I gave actually the same survey, same number of, of, of uh, respondents and res responses in Portland last year. And in fact, U.S. results were the same for the top reasons. People use their cars for vacations, visiting relatives, visiting friends. But then the lines were also very high for uh, taking the kids to school, going to work, going to grocery shopping. It's sort of the lines were like all blue all the way, right? So people are using their cars for everything, whereas in the Netherlands, they're just those top you know, three or four main reasons. And then the rest are more incidental and more, they do them only, you know, once a week or only on the weekend, they go and do their sports activity or go visit a friend or go take grandma grocery shopping. But the rest of the time, you know, they're not like the U.S. We use the car for everything. Yeah. Everywhere, all the time, all you, <laughs> I love the fact that just at 2% household chores or getting the child to school 4%. Isn't that amazing? It's just reflective. It, it really is reflective of the, um, of the point of the fact that when you create a community environment where there is mobility choice, then people can make kind of fitting in with those five values that you said you know, you're talking about, they can make the pragmatic, logical sort of choice of their mobility and then the other values. And it's cost effective. You know, it's like, oh, what's the most frugal thing for us to do? Well, it's not to be jumping into a very, very space inefficient energy hog of a car and, and drive there. No, it, it makes way more sense for us to, to walk, bike, used public transit to be able to get to our daily needs. I wanted to call out to uh, Marco, uh, to uh, Bruno Strot and uh, Talia Fricada, who have been the, the people in the Netherlands that have done some of the most uh, thoughtful work on car culture in the Netherlands. I think that m many people in the Netherlands are still studying, you know, the bike as a standalone object and and uh, Marco and Talia are actually looking at car culture as a culture and how the Netherlands can actually control cars uh, and sort of take them out of the equation and start looking at public space and safety as as their own values. Yeah. And and he he does a good job in the book that they recently written there, too of talking about some of the realities. A, it was great because it, it, he was able to share some of his own experiences growing up there and shared an experience of a fatality that happened uh, with one of his, his uh, school childhood mates, friends. Ch yeah. childhood friends. And, uh, and so it, it kind of is like a, a foundation to where the rest of the book goes. And then he even talks a little bit about his current situation of where he's living now and the the relationship of you know the automobile even in the dutch context so i included this because this is a view from my language school i take dutch lessons two two mornings a week and this is where the students park the students and staff um and it's just incredible when you look at the cars across the street they're seven or eight cars there, how much space is occupied by bike parking versus how much is occupied by car parking. And it's interesting that Utrecht, of course, still allows car parking along the canals. But I, one thing I wanted to mention about it is, and I did surveys along the canals of, you know, that, that survey that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and a lot of people responded to that. Parking here costs upwards of it depends but between one and four thousand dollars a year to park here and within the next five years or so uh, every single bit of curb space in Utrecht will have some cost associated with it that is you can't park anywhere on any street without paying a price to park 
there, which is logical. I mean, of course, parking yeah. takes space. But imagine charging for parking in the U.S. in a residential neighborhood. You know, imagine even charging for parking in some shopping districts. You know, the merchants wouldn't like it. The, and, and yet, you know, it's something that actually makes the city more livable. Yes, of course, people need to park along the street in front of these these houses that they're living in. But they're paying money to park there, you know, and they're paying something that's reasonable that they're willing to pay. And it gives the city the money to do some of the infrastructure work that they do as well. So it's a value. You know, people say, yes, we can share, but we have to share by giving something, not just taking something. Yeah. Uh, our good friend Donald Shoup would be quite proud. <laughs> Author oh, yeah. of The High Cost of Free Parking. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, here, here we are in a classroom. Or in this a, is in not a, a classroom. A this is a, this is is a, a planning room. meeting. This is so so. I yeah. So one of the so ways let me that ask I'm you this before we before you get into the details of this earlier uh, on the previous photo, you you had mentioned that this is the a uh, view from your language uh, uh, class. So I, I I think I assumed that the next slide was of your class. <laughs> oh, um, how's uh, how's how's learning Dutch coming along? Pretty good. Uh, I did, you know, years of Duolingo, and then I decided, you know, I really need to just hammer down, take classes, and and do volunteer work that's entirely in Dutch. And that's the way that I'm I'm learning it. And I'm hoping within the next by the time I I see you in the in the summer that I'm going to be good enough to. I mean, I've I've been good enough to do sort of everyday living kind of stuff in Dutch, but I'll be good enough to actually have meaningful conversations with people by the summer. So for the planning uh, commission meetings, planning meetings, are they in Dutch? Absolutely. This is a great way for me to learn Dutch. It's, it's just show, and it's, you know, it's obviously the, the vocabulary that I care the most about being a planner. I'm curious about how people respond, you know, and I, I actually contribute to things in, in Dutch in these planning meetings. And, you know, it's, uh, what I wanted to say, though, is that the, you know, the the tone, the tenor of the meetings is very similar to what you'll see in the U.S. You know, the kinds of people that show up are the the older people, the right. the, the white people, the property owner people, uh, and yet, um, you know, they're willing to make a lot of compromise at these meetings, uh, but. So I have a couple of pictures of just typical planning meetings. If you want to just scroll through the next one or two of them, I mean, you've seen this picture, right? In not this particular picture, but this yeah, is, yeah. This, this, is this, this is the classic, you know, uh, open house, you know, planning meeting yep. you know, picture. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So this is, you know, and I mean, I if I had one kind of complaint about the planning meetings is that they don't do a very good job here in the Netherlands of reaching out to the immigrant communities of okay. actually engaging non-white, younger, uh, disabled people who have, you know, special In other words, the same of. challenge we have. Yes. Absolutely. But I think that, <laughs> that Americans do a better job of trying to be a little bit more deliberate about that kind of outreach. And I think the Dutch are still working on it. However, the thing that allows people to use consensus, and I wanted to just bring this up because it's it's the revelation that I you know learned about last year is that any city, so Utrecht is a city of about uh, 350,000 people. You know, any city Utrecht size or larger in the Netherlands has an open space handbook. So they look at, how they are supposed to do uh, any kind of change to their open space, whether it's a park, a plaza, or a street, with these handbooks uh, that are very detailed and really smart. So I've looked at the handbooks from a number of different cities, but they specify exactly what materials need to get used, how they're supposed to be implemented, how much it costs to maintain those materials, and where to source these materials. And so they're the same throughout the, the whole city. Uh, if you look through this, this uh, and how much emergency services need to use these, these places. The, the reason that 
I bring this up is that not only do they produce these handbooks that people need to adhere to, you know, specifications, but all of the various departments that deal with these materials, be they the plumbers, the park commissioners, the uh, emergency service people, the transportation planners, they all have to come together and reach consensus twice a month in Utrecht. I don't know if it's the same number of times in other cities, but this forces people to give and take, right? The emergency services people might want something different than the the plumbers want and might want something different than the, the parks people want. And yet they all come to understand which, what each other's issues are. And the city becomes stronger for it because they're educating each other, because they're learning from each other. So this handbook that they adapt and adopt and change every three years or so uh, becomes this, this vehicle that allows them to travel to better and better city plans. It's it's logical, it's practical, and it's also something that allows people to do some compromise on. So I got to know the, the emergency services people, and that's how I learned about these, these handbooks, and also learned about it through the, uh, the parking people. Uh, so uh, in Utrecht, it's uh, Frank van der Zanden and Herbert Tiemens. Uh, Frank does the, the uh, kind of the open space handbook in general, and Herbert Tiemens is specializing in bikes. And then um, uh, I've high in the parking department. And get, they all know each other. They all sit around the same table. They all kind of reach compromise. Uh, and because they've reached this consensus, when they go out to the community, they can say, yes, we've looked at all these different things, these aspects of a city, and we've reached a compromise of how to create a city that's that's kind of best for people. So it, it's something, you know, I've done these kinds of, of projects where you're making changes to a park or a street. Uh, and instead of run, like running around from the emergency services department to the, to the, the, uh, the parks commission, to the streets commission, to the plumbers, to the electricians, to, to everybody, it'd be great to have this one table where people are reaching compromise yeah. and a yeah. handbook that kind of guided you to it. And we've been paused here on the uh, the emergency services uh, fire department uh, uh, little vehicle here. Little teeny fire engine. This uh, is, little this teeny is... fire engine. Yeah, we, we in North America. You know, bear with us, uh, those of you in 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 Europe watching this. Uh, we're so fascinated with the fact that your equipment is right sized to an appropriate uh, dimension. Uh, way. Too many of our vehicles, uh, emergency services vehicles in the United States are supersized beyond belief. And then sometimes there's a friction that takes place between those emergency services vehicles and departments like the fire department uh, resisting against right sizing, <laughs> you creating streets that are more human scale. Uh, because they say, well, we no, we can't have that narrow lane. We can't do this. We can't do that because our, our equipment won't fit. We need to transform our built environment, our cities, to accommodate our vehicles versus the other way around. So, yeah, we are fascinated by your delightful, cute little uh, fire trucks. And, uh, <laughs> and, they, and you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the Dutch are just like the, the fire department in the Netherlands. They just laugh at the, the American fire trucks. They just think they're the strangest things, you know. The, these these respond, to, you know, the, the, the Dutch in Utrecht can respond to any emergency. I think it's within eight minutes. Uh, anywhere in the whole city. And I've seen um, plenty of first responders uh, over in Europe uh, responding on uh, bicycles and also motorcycles too. So they're Absolutely. not always just rolling an oversized vehicle for something that doesn't need that oversized vehicle. And every fire truck is exactly the same. So they're interchangeable. If one breaks, they just get another one and kind of plug it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And in fact, this 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 little video here shows that the bike paths, a lot of them are also emergency service response paths. Right. That's an ambulance. Yes. You know. Yeah, that is an ambulance, folks. And I'm glad you, you, you included this little clip, too, because too often our ambulances are also de facto looking like this size. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> 
Uh, the other th neat thing, and I love the fact that you included those dimensions and those uh, guides uh, that looked at materials and everything. I love this little video clip that you have of uh, you know some of the workers laying down the wonderful pavers. The it clinkers. is very prescribed to the clinkers, and it's very prescribed, you know, what kind of material, what the underlayment needs to be, you know, what the pattern needs to be for every, you know, part of the city. You know, there's 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 areas of the city that are very, um, you know, fine and polished. They're sort of mid-level, which is what this this particular site is, that need to be nice, but not super nice. And then there's kind of the more suburban areas of the city. And that handbook like lays it out. People know exactly what to do so things can get built quickly, repaired quickly. And this is an entire street along a canal n near the the train station just, just south of... Uh, of uh, the central station in Utrecht that is getting finished. And actually in the next slide, so this um, this was put in over the summer. This is the completed pathway that was done in about two months. Yeah. Which is a beautiful pathway, but this is sort of the, the mid-level improvement for a canal path. And it looks like this gorgeous place that's been like this for the last hundred years and yet it's a brand new pathway it's a brand new and brand new what, what's interesting too and, and stefan bear and i had this conversation uh stefan is the traffic advisor for the city of harlem and uh we talked a little bit about the use of clinkers and the types of streets and, and the context uh that that the cities are the dutch cities are, are looking to employ uh, of when to use them how to use them and the strategies for using them and what I love about that approach is just on a street like this and some of the other you know, residential access streets where you're deploying the use of the, the, the red colored bricks and clinkers, it's, it's also sending a message that A, this is a slow speed zone. It's, it's not an area that you as a driver are going to be, be expecting to go be driving quickly in. And two, or as a biker too. Well, yeah, and as a, as a biker too, it's 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 certainly not made to be ultra ultra smooth. But the the other thing, especially when they do keep it that consistent red color, it is also communicating to the drivers that oh by the way, you're going to be sharing space with with people on bikes, and you can expect that. And so you get that consistency of that color scheme that we also see on the uh, the feet struts and the bike sharing the bike priority streets that are out there so i love that consistency that in most cases sometimes you run into cases where they've used a different color but in most municipalities uh they're using that consistent red color on the the clinkers and the red asphalt and look at this just the yeah beautiful uh, uh bollards you know those those concrete bollards the the street lights and those have all been selected by a city planning process in the, it's called a handbook op, open by Ramta, the handbook of, op, of public space, because the street is considered a public space. So the, you know, the, the designer didn't have to like go to some manual or invent something on their own. It's just like every street that is in this kind of an area will get the same treatment with the same degree of material materiality yeah yeah i love it i love it okay so this is this is one of the many 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 festivals that that utrecht has i mean it's an insane number of festivals for a city of this size and you can't turn around without another one so this is a winter festival the light festival there's the i have another photo of the king's birthday the konigstag festival uh, pride fest so that's the king's day that's coming up in April. And then there's another one called uh, well, Pride Fest we have everywhere. But uh, actually why I pulled this particular one up is this is in Utrecht and it's on the canal, uh, kind of the main canal that used to be a freeway. So the, the freeway was taken out, the canal put back in and people sitting on either side are sitting on stairs that were built in the last year uh, by the municipal government to because they knew things like this would be happening, these major events along the canal. And they're great places to sit in the sun during the rest of the year. So it's a very busy, festive 
area. But the the festivals. That I- what a great transformation, right? You know, this is this has oh, been incredible. such a joy to watch. Um, and I say watch because I've been returning to Utrecht not every year, but many years uh, since uh, twenty fifteen when they were still in the process of of digging out the the highway and and reestablishing what was once a canal back and transforming it back into a canal just been, been I mean can you imagine I, I did not see the city when it had the freeway there and certainly I watched these stairs on the on the uh, right side of the, the photo being built you know they're brick stairs and and they're a beloved part of the city and you know you would look at them again and think oh they've been here, there for decades but you know Brand new in the past year. One of the uh, uh, fabulous interviews that I had was with Hert uh, Vandervilt, uh, the guy behind uh, De- the film Defeats Her channel. When, when I was riding with him past this, he was saying, uh, we paused here and, and he was talking about how delightful it is now that he can, he can paddle. He can get in his his uh, canoe, his boat, and he can he can paddle all you know up through here as a little bit of a kayak, you know, sort of workout or whatever, and just experience the city in a different way, uh, and just how much joy that brought him because he he grew up right there in the city, and so being able to to see something that you know he grew up with as being just this nasty freeway, highway, a highway to nowhere essentially you know, get taken out and transformed. And so again, another lesson to cities around the globe, if you're a car centric city uh, and infrastructure is in place and people are telling you, no, it can't be removed, you can't fix it. That ain't true, you can fix it. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. And there was a lot of people that worked hard to make this transformation happen. And it's a beautiful and well, you know, used and loved space. Uh, I just threw in a couple of pictures too about unique festivals that I think are really important that the government supports, that are so important for building tolerance and building social bonds. And this one I love. It's called Soup Out Iderahuk, which means soup on every corner. Love it. And it lets people, new immigrants. And it's a week long. Open their houses, just have an open open house or open a community center and make the soups that they're familiar with and share them with the broader community. I mean, it's it's something that the government has actually put real money into and invested in. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah. And then this is another festival that happens twice a year called Glöden by the Burden, which means basically performances in the neighborhood. And this is another open house kind of thing where people do music and dance and poetry readings and just open their houses. Uh, And this particular festival has been going on for the last 10 years or so. And it's just like this. I mean, this, I heard this wonderful Klezmer concert here. I went to, I think, four different concerts in the last Glöder and Badeberin. And they were all over Utrecht, but it was a way of getting to know my neighbors and getting to know their particular talents and a government supported way of opening your house and sort of opening your heart. This is a map of where all the, the glaring by the burr and the music performances were around Utrecht. Just tremendous outpouring of, of love through that. It's, it seems like you're, you're not finding anything to do there, Kathy. Yeah, but I mean, I think you know, the, you know, it's it's one of the things that it's super important for for uh, kind of creating the community cohesion, and perhaps you know, the people that are participating in that will later start coming to some of these public meetings and making suggestions for how they want their city to be transformed. This is a really interesting holiday that started in the beginning part of the nineteen hundreds, called Avonsfeer Dagse which means four nights of, it's a four night walk. And all public, all uh, school children between kindergarten and high school do, depending on their ages, between a kilometer every night to 10 kilometers every night. And they, they go out with their parents every single evening for a whole week and take a walk. And then they all collect at the very end from all this. This is in Houghton, uh, which you said you visited. 
which has a new book coming out about it too. I'll, I'll yes, they, give yes, you information I'm, about that. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that. In fact, uh, I was able to profile uh, that new book being uh, Robert established. Dirks and, yeah. Yes, Robert Dirks and, and all of that uh, in Boderham the interview that I did uh, with Kylie. Right, Kylie. Is, is, is one of the residents there in Houghton. So I'll, I'll be sure to include that link in the show notes as well, folks, because uh, that's a fabulous uh, profile of... Um, it's a suburban community that has been kind of created from the ground up that's car-free. But very, very young. Well, and I wouldn't even call it car free, Kathy. I would re- really call it uh, a, a community where uh, many of the residents actually do have cars, but the circulation plan that has been created, they have a management plan for the cars where uh, the the cars are not able to, the, the drivers are not able to penetrate into the into the city center. And so everything in the city center is accessible by walking, biking, and transit. Whereas if you're a resident with a car, you drive in from the circle road, the circulator road, uh, and then you can access and park your vehicle. And then once you're home, you, you yeah. want, once you're home, you're car free. <laughs> <laughs> and you have free parking. So I, I wanted to mention to this, this fellow in the center, uh, welcoming all the children, all the four or 5,000 school children from all over Houghton. And he did high fives and shook hands with almost every one of them is the mayor of the town, uh, Gilbert uh, Isabella. And he is also the president of the uh, National Feasers Bond. Ah, he is. Wow. He is. So he is a very supportive person for, uh, for biking and for walking, clearly here. But again, the the Avonsfjord Dagse is something that brings everybody in the community together. People of all you know ages and all um, you know the new immigrants, the you know the the established people in town, and such a strong way to get people walking and get people active too. This is the first time I'm hearing of this particular event. Do you know what the origins of, of the event, or you know what were the the purpose of the origins of it? I think it was just to, you know, get people healthy and get people walking. And I know it was actually, I read about it on, in like Wikipedia, it was banned during, uh, you know, when there was a Nazi occupation because they didn't want people healthy and out there walking. Right. Uh, So it might've had something to do with that as well. You know, what popularized it? Well, during occupation, um, you know, a lot of things were banned, including just getting around on your bicycle for any other purpose. That yeah, too. So, yeah, that too. Yeah. Fascinating. Oh. Okay. Now we're okay, on so to that's bike a, sharing. <laughs> well, it's about sharing in general. So these things are called OV feats. So feats means bicycle. And uh, these are the bicycles that are provided, well, you pay five euros for 24-hour use. Right. At every every single Dutch train station has OV feats. Uh, and there are, I think, 2,000 at the Utrecht train station. And it looks like a lot. They get taken out. They're gone by 10 in the morning. It's amazing. So what you're looking at are share bikes that people Sure. I mean, yeah. they take and, them, and, they use and what's, them. What's, yeah. And what's great about this is these bikes are actually the property of, you know, the transit authority, the, the you know, the, the and they that's one of the reason why, yeah, they maintain them and it's integrated with your transit card. And so when you're, when you get off the train at your destination, you may have ridden your own private bike to the train station. The train station. About 40% Perfect. of all train trips uh, are in fact uh, by... Uh, accessed by a private bicycle, and then you know, let's just say you're 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 at uh, you know you, you live in Utrecht and you're riding your bike and you park in the beautiful uh, twelve thousand parking spots, one of the many twelve thousand different parking spots in the in the garage there, uh, and you get to a new destination and you can use that same transit card to check out if you're going to a meeting, if you're you know going to visit art museums or to visit friends. So you don't have to take the car. So this is the, uh, well, actually, there are two main uh, parking garages under the Utrecht station. This is the first one they built that holds, I think, 3,500 people on bikes. 
and it was too small very quickly. Yeah. Imagine that 3,500 bikes was too small. And and I I just pulled the number 12,000 out of my head. It may not be at all correct because I so get confused one, with the this number. Is the, this is the new, this is the new garage that opened a few years ago. And it uh, has 14,000, I want to say. So together they have 17,000-ish places go. for people to park their bikes. And I think this, this parking garage, I mean, every visitor that comes here, I take them to the parking garage. I think it is like a temple to great architecture and beautiful design. And it is. I'm, it's, I'm, it's crack, I'm cracking up here because it's like you, you can just imagine, you know, uh, people who are not in the bubble of urbanism and active mobility <laughs> and, and they get your, your family comes to visit you there and, and Kathy says, okay, I'm gonna go show you this most amazing thing. We're gonna go to a bicycle parking garage. <laughs> yeah, you and I were But it we're also giggling. reflects this, this, this thing about this, this value, this Dutch value of, you know, sharing and self-reliance. I mean, I think it's a great kind of manifestation of that 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 beautiful way of of actually this was my bike last year i got a different bike this year but uh, uh this is a double decker parking lot uh and also i think it's four stories high which is how it can fit in fourteen thousand bikes in one garage and if this were a place that had to store fourteen thousand cars there would be no room for basically anything else in downtown Utrecht. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Another great view. Great view. The OV, OV feeds. Do you know if they have opened up the ability for uh, people visiting the Netherlands to use their transit pass uh, to do this? Or do you still have to have a, a Dutch bank account to be able to uh, um, You still need to have the, the Dutch account because, you know, if the Dutch with their 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 transit card are taking them all out, you know, there's just too much uh, pressure on having having that. Yeah, yeah, and that's fine because you know, for 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 those of us who are visiting uh, from outside uh, the nation, we can uh, rent a bike or do what I do. I bring my own Brompton. And uh, all and all of y'all uh, love to tease me about uh, riding my Brompton uh, in the Netherlands, but that's the reason why. If if I could easily uh, use the Ove Feats, maybe I wouldn't need to bring my Brompton. Plus, but you can other... take the Brompton on on the train for free. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because it it folds up. It's so small. It goes underneath my seat. It's not taking up any space, which I'm very conscious of. I don't want to take up any extra space. Uh, because the trains are also full. Uh, so the other great scheme, uh, bike sharing scheme that's out there is this that I just love. I always smile when I see the the bright uh, blue front wheel of the Swap Feats. This is so cool. Yeah, that's how you know that it's a Swap Feats is that blue tire. And you see a lot in Utrecht because there are a lot of students and a lot of visitors. It's it's actually a pretty expensive scheme. The thing that, that actually makes it worthwhile is that if you have any kind of mechanical problems, if you have a flat tire, anything goes wrong with it, you can swap it out. Yeah. So renting hence a... The name. Yeah, hence the name, Swap Feeds. They, 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 they will literally just swap it out and boom, you've got a new ride. And, you know, it, and oftentimes it's more efficient to do that than necessarily try to really figure out, okay, what's the issue with it, et cetera. They'll just bring you a new, new bike. Boom. And the other reason that I, some of the Dutch people I know who have swap feats have decided to have swap feats is that you don't worry about theft. Right. Um, so if you have locked it and it gets stolen, you can get another swap feats. Yeah. Yeah. And this particular version is their uh, their electric assist version as well. So they they have the the old fashioned analog, and then they also now um, do offer an electric assist version too. So. But they're pretty pricey. I mean, the, the bike oh, yeah. that I have is a, uh, you know, cost me 100 euros. And a swap feeds for six months is more than 100 euros. So. Yeah. No, it's the, it, there's a price associated with that. But if you are somebody who needs a dependable ride and you are not good at fixing your own bike, 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, you might decide the uh, it's it's and it's you have the theft it. concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you're doing a move, if you're you have kids for a while, you know, I have some friends who are visiting with with uh, young children in the summer. Yeah. You know, I'm going to recommend that they get a uh, cargaru. Yeah. So the cargaru for the the listening only audience, what we're looking at here on screen is an urban arrow that has a custom paint job of a yellow. Uh, side panel, it's cargo. So it is a cargo bike sharing uh, type of an electric assist cargo bike uh, sharing scheme where if you are in need of a cargo bike, uh, you can rent one. Um, they're deployed uh, around the cities of the cities that, that uh, this has been deployed in. And uh, you can use an app to be able to unlock the vehicle, take it, do whatever you need to do, go pick up some something big grocery shopping, go to the garden supply store or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, a car replacement rather than having to rent a car or use your own car uh, to do an errand or whatever, or even pile the kids in for that matter. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going someplace Mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, you don't feel comfortable with the kids riding that entire time. You can drop those kids into the front bucket there of this urban arrow and go explore. Again, it fits really nicely with that sharing and self-reliance value of the Dutch. And then there's another new company called Bike Flip that I wanted to mention that I think it's a really clever company. So it turns out that kids start off with those little balance bikes where they walk along. Right. And then when they're about you know three years old or so, they start pedaling on teeny little wheels. And then they get a little bigger and a little bigger. And they're they go through about 10 sizes of bikes. Right. And this company, it's an actually a place where I've been volunteering, lets parents bring the old bike back or you swap out the bike, you you know, look up a new bike on online and they'll deliver it to you as your kid grows. So you go through and you flip your bike. What's nice too is that they have subsidies from the government so that very low income people, new immigrants can get these bikes for free for their kids and they can grow up through the, the various ages of kids on a bike. This is, this is their uh, main branch just outside of Utrecht. And they have, you know, they're, they're very interested too in the kind of the circular economy and keeping waste out of the system because bikes generally when, when they're done, get melted down and built into new metal things. And this is a way of keeping bikes in circulation and they can provide a pretty reasonable bike for just a few euros a month for kids. It's a, it's a great system. I I love this too. And uh, another brand that I love to support, uh, they, they have their North American headquarters here in Austin. Uh, their world headquarters are in Austria, uh, just outside of Vienna. And it's, that's the womb bicycle company. And, uh, they provide everything for, for kids from, uh, again, the balance bikes on up. And they also have a similar type of program where, you know, the parent can, you know, turn the, the bike in when it's time for the kid to size up to the next bike. And, uh, they can, you know, take care of, you know, bikes all the way up until uh, a, a child is somewhere around the uh, a teenager about 13 14 years of age that's yeah. exactly this yeah this model and they're nice quality bikes but they use the ones that you know people have donated it or they get a big shipment of you know a thousand bikes and then they refurbish them and put them out i love it uh and i just threw in a couple of pictures of how independent children really are in the netherlands too i mean once they're in that kind of, well, this this picture actually is is people taking young children taking their uh, test. Yes. Of yeah. Usually about certified. Eleven or twelve years. Eleven of age, years old. Through. Eleven or twelve years old. So those this uh, children that you saw in the previous slide were about that age, and they have complete independence. I mean, that's something that actually makes a child happy, is to be able to have their own wheels and get around. So here's volunteers, probably parents evaluating how well the children are completing a route, an urban route on their own through the city uh, and, you know, judging if they're safe enough to be able to go by bike to their sports games or to visit friends. And what a, what a great way to just build self-reliance in children. And what's really interesting too about this is when, when you arrive and you spend time in the Netherlands, you might just kind of assume 
that it's just a free for all that you know people just grow up this way and and and, and it's it's like no they're, they're they are quite intentional about doing things like this and the these exams that take place uh, to really certify that yeah by the time because there is that expectation by 11 or 12 you as a child are able to get around on your own and be able to get to meaningful destinations and do so safely and really truly understand what it's like to be able to get around and what i love about the way that it's done is that you will see them with the you know this this process and you'll see them going through the exams out on real city streets which is just you know to me that's just really brilliant uh, having you know done bike ed programs uh, led bike ed programs for fourth graders and you know we would do a, a little traffic garden type of thing on the basketball court and teaching bike handling skills and whatnot i mean this really takes it to that next level of assuring ensuring that in fact you know they are able to get around their community and be able to go about their daily needs and that they're so you know building self-reliance from the ground exactly up. exactly yeah building that self-reliance so we're now looking at a, a photo on screen here from 1977 so we're going back in history a little bit here <laughs> yeah and i actually wanted to call out uh, mark vachabir from uh from uh, Bicycle Dutch, who yes. is the person who d digs these old photos up. And I think he, he provided this one as well. And this is, you know, in Utrecht, a commercial street. You can see there are bike lanes probably in the door zone. Is that right? I think so. It's hard to say. I'm looking at it too. I think it, that's right. It might just be a free-for-all. <laughs> that might actually well, they're be lines, a, they're I think lines you, I think, painted yeah. there. On the on the left, yes, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think it is a, like a, a door zone sort of situation. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you're correct. So this was a situation 50 years ago, and the the uh, the little video I have in the next slide here is a, I don't know if it's the same street. It might be. It's Amsterdam Vech in uh, in Utrecht, but it's you know it's not like super elegant, but it gets the job done. You know. Bikes now are protected, but they're still parking. Right. Right. And it allows people to who are biking to uh, and or using mobility devices of all kinds to actually access stores, to do parking, to uh, kind of pay attention to what's going on in their community. I mean, it's a it's a huge transformation, even though it's just taking a tiny bit of space. Right. And I love this too. Uh, thank you so much for providing this video, uh, Kathy. Um, for those of the in the listening audience, uh, we're look, seeing a scene here of you know just a unidirectional bicycle path, bicycle lane. It's protected. It's protected by some trees. It's protected by I think a little it's bit of narrow. parking as well. It's it's narrow. Yeah. But what's what you're seeing? You're seeing so many different dynamics. You mentioned person on a mobility scooter there. You see a, a, a commercial delivery person uh, almost salmoning the opposite direction, almost hitting the person on the mobility scooter. But because the speeds are so low. It's like it's a collision that never happened because mm -hmm. everybody's moving at more human pace. And then the next thing you see is a person, you know, riding by with a little trailer behind. And it looks like they may have had either sporting equipment or maybe that was a musical uh, a, a piece, a mu musical equipment uh, device uh, strapped into it. There's just so much life and so much vibrancy that's happening. There's bike in this. parking. There's people yes. walking. Yeah. Yeah, so much, so so much going on, and and this is another uh, image that you have here, or, or excuse me, a video that you have here of, of just the busy throng buses. of people. We've got buses, we've got people walking, we've got people biking, and it takes us back to that conversation that we started out with that very first video, of how much life can happen between our buildings in this public realm between our buildings, which in North America just typically gets turned over to automobiles and becomes really a traffic sewer rather than a vibrant place that's really happening. The other thing that's notable is how calm people are. There's somebody walking with a child, there are old people walking across the street. This again is the, that street that carries 40,000 
people a day. And yet there's not this, you know, the person who has the child isn't dragging them along crying and, you know, walking, you know, fearfully across the street. The old people are walking at a dignified pace. The people who are crossing the street on their bikes are going at a slow pace, paying attention to bikes. Even though there's lots of activity, there's lots of other vehicles, there's buses, there's other pedestrians, but people are moving in a way that supports human life. Yeah. And you'll also notice there's there's zero traffic controls happening here, too. Yep. People yep. are passing when it's safe to pass. People are proceeding. And look at that child. You know, proceed. I mean, imagine if you had a child, you were crossing any street in your, your you know, any North American city that had 40,000 vehicles. You yeah. know, you'd be panicked. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and if I were to, to, to criticize this in any way, shape or form, it might be that, you know, for the future, it, it might be a situation where we, we try to turn even more of this space over to even more people and, you know, try to reimagine where the transit and how the transit is happening so that there is, you know, fewer conflicts, uh, you know, with the buses. Because even in that environment, it doesn't take much imagination to realize that there could be some casualties, you know, in that situation. But this is so much further along from a development perspective from where we're at in most car-centric cities globally uh, that I think there's so many great lessons to learn from this, especially since, you know, compared to what this was like in 1964. Right. And, you know, it's also lined with businesses and lined with, you know, people shopping and lined with with activity happening. I mean, the Dutch have figured out that and this is sort of the last point is, is you know, the Dutch are people that are very cost conscious. You know, they know that using bikes builds wealth for for everyone. You know, this is a, a great example of it. I, I wanted to also just kind of end with the fact that there's all these great bike lanes everywhere. Uh, it's not just in the densest part of cities, it's everywhere. And the other thing that I, as I was looking through my slides uh, the other day, is I've noticed that e-bikes are being used in an interesting way in the Netherlands. This is a slight grade up, and the person on the right has the e-bike, I think, and then the person on the left is holding onto their arm and getting a little boost to go up the hill as they're biking. So it's a, a kind of a common thing. And actually the next slide shows the same action. Somebody is holding on to the person next to them, not because they're great friends, although I'm sure they are, but it's because the one person has the e-bike and the other person gets a little boost moving up that slight grade. But these, these, these. And that brings up the good point of why it's so important to have these wider cycle paths is so that a it's it's social activity you want to be side by side to be able to do that and you'll frequently see parents doing the same thing a, you know a hand you know behind the back of a child and kind of helping them move move along and get up a, a steeper grade and so uh it, it's very much a part of I think uh, treating people who are getting around through active mobility modes with dignity of you're really making that experience truly a an inviting experience. And a big part of that is those wider facilities that are quite comfortable to be able to go side by side. And also, you know, getting back to the sharing thing. I mean, these are streets that are shared. This is a this is a car and truck street that these these uh, several people on bikes are on, and yet they're using it in a very uh, comfortable way. You know, they don't feel threatened at all as they're biking along. You know, they're older. They're able to ride with dignity. This this is uh, close to where I live, close to where my language class is, and just showing people bike in all kinds of weather, but also that there are lots of delivery vehicles still within, you know, what a lot of us would call the pedestrian areas of, of downtown Utrecht. You know, there's lots of drop-offs. This is only in early morning when the big trucks can come, but there's lots of ways that streets are shared at all times of the day. But one of the things that that brings up is that I wanted to just put a plug in for the Cargo Bike Festival, which I hope you come for. It's in October. Um, and it's something that 
the Dutch are really starting to embrace as well because cargo bikes make sense at the city level. The big trucks can come early in the morning, but there's still deliveries that need to happen. And the cargo bikes are where it's at. The kind of innovation that's going on within the kind of cargo bike community, I think is more important than what's going on in anything in American automotive work. I mean, the e-vehicles and the the autonomous vehicles are just kind of the same tune, just played in a slightly different key. Whereas cargo bike technology is completely transformational in how people get around. So yeah. some of the things that I saw at, at the cargo bike uh, festival last year are just wonderful. And they, they have a track where you can try out all different kinds of cargo bikes and compare what works and what doesn't. There were some that just, blew my mind you know there was a cargo bike that was a trash collection bu- collection bike and there were other ones that you know sort of stretched the boundaries of what a bike really was but it's that micro mobility that is most appropriate for cities and makes sense from an economic perspective too yeah yeah and uh and and of course uh you know uh, folks that have been following along uh, closely to the channel know that I've had Jos uh, Schleuschmans on the, the channel. So the International Cargo Bike Festival is his organization, that he uh, his event that he puts on each year. So be sure to check out uh, that episode of when I interviewed him. And I was there for the festival uh, back in 2022. Uh, so I was on site there. So I do have some videos that you can check out here on the channel as well. This is, this is my favorite. This is a uh, a buck uh, a buck feats that's actually a like a a, a jitney you can put people in yeah, front of a, it and a, then... a trishaw yeah yeah it's, yeah a trishaw it, it, yeah you can you can you you can sit sit two people in front. Uh, Cycling without age uh, has a version of this uh, you know trishaw where they go get around to the retirement communities and the nursing home communities and be able to get people who are no longer able to to ride uh, you know on their own but still benefit tremendously from uh, having a breath of fresh air and so uh, it was a, a an absolute uh, joy being able to profile the cycling without age uh, also on a previous episode so yeah those are fantastic it's a, it's a beautiful bike it's a beautiful bike actually there were a couple bikes this is a few more in the i'm sure you have a lot of these videos too it's so much fun to just test out these different uh, ways of carrying material around cities this is a uh, another bike that can seat three children on it that long tail yeah and and to your point is it's like these are you, you called it micro mobility too and this is part of what we are seeing more cities in the, the the European you know countries embracing is this concept of look yeah businesses need to get their their products delivered and their services you know addressed and and so but when you're dealing with limited space and you know it, it just makes way more sense to deploy something that's appropriately sized for what you're doing and if you have to bring in a big vehicle okay let's let's have a specific window of time when there's less stress on the streets, when there's... And also battery capacity. I mean, how much this thing weighs versus, yeah. Yeah. This was everybody's favorite bike at the Cargo Bike Festival, including mine. It's the it's the post-delivery bike. Yeah, so, so much fun to ride. Yeah, and that's, that's the end. That's the end of the visuals there, uh, uh, Kathy. Uh, to close us out, any final thoughts, especially given the context of, of what we were talking about earlier from a cultural perspective? And as an anthropologist, when you're like, you're, you're seeing things through that lens, similar to how I see um, communities through the lens uh, of, of public health and uh, encouraging people to live a healthy, active lifestyle. So I have that lens of, is this an activity asset or not? Um, you, you're, you've, you're clearly in, in your realm out there. You're clearly just absolutely soaking this up. As an anthropologist, you're, you're like really seeing that, that intersection that's taking place between the, the culture that is, has been established and the culture that it continues to evolve this very day, as well as these events that are happening and how they're supporting other people. 
yeah, you, you've got to be just pinching yourself and every day. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we often hear that, you know, it's, you know, you have to look at a city's budget to actually look at how, you know, what their values are. Right. right? What they prioritize. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your city prioritizes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's also, it's showing your, your cultural values as well. I mean, you know, you judge a government by how it spends its money. Uh, and you choose as a society to elect people to spend money in a certain way. And the Dutch values of, you know, and I, actually I would love to hear from any Dutch people who are listening to this, this show is, you know, the ones that I, the values that I've come up with of, of you know, that practical, logic, punctual value, the consensus building, the tolerance, the sharing and self-reliance, and the saving money values. You know, do those make sense? And are those values reflected in the in the values that you see in the built environment? Uh, are these things that you think your government does for your streets? And, you know, also I'd like to know about what, what people in other countries see as the values that are reflected in the streets that their government provides for them. You know, what have we chosen to invest in because it reflects who we are you know our place reflects who we are because we we are the place you know we are the people that live in it at this particular time at this particular point in time yeah yeah very well said okay folks you heard her let us know what you think uh in the comments down below uh and Kathy, I look forward to seeing you in just a couple of months. This is going to be fun. Fellow City, uh, yeah. Yes, at Fellow City. And also uh, in your fine city of Utrecht, I will come spend some time with you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. That was great. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Kathy Tuttle. And if you did, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and be sure to ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please help support my efforts by becoming a Patreon supporter, uh, buy me a coffee, a YouTube super thanks right down below, as well as making donations to the nonprofit. It's all easy to do. Just navigate over to activetowns.org and click on that support button. Button. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.